So we're going to talk about multicollinearity here. Chapter 7, and the reading is in Woolridge, which you are expected to read, of course. The issue of multicollinearity refers to assumption 3. That was the assumption where we assumed that there was no perfect relationship between elements in X, so X was full rank. Now, if A3 breaks down, that was the consequence. The consequence was that we couldn't invert X prime X inverse. But of course, that was needed to calculate beta hat. Remember the formula for beta hat. So that would be the case if we had, for instance, two elements that were perfectly correlated. As the simplest case, we could also have a combination of some elements in X being able to perfectly explain another element in X. Now, often we'll not have perfect relation, but just a multicollinearity, but we'll just have the case where X, two elements in X are quite strongly related. What that leads to is inflated standard errors for beta hat. So we'll look at that be, look at that below, why that is. But if we have this, then let's just look what the t test looks like. Our standard t test, the standard error of beta hat or the j of the element of beta hat appears in the denominator here and of course if that guy becomes very large then the t-test will become very small and the consequence of small t-tests is that unduly small t-tests is that it's less likely to we are less likely to reject a null hypothesis so it makes it more difficult to do that if we have a problem of multicollinearity now, two examples where we can expect multicollinearity. I'd say here we're having cross-sectional data. Our dependent variable is um, a household's expense for holidays, and we regress that on pre-tax household income and uh, the amount of income tax paid by households. Because we we'll think both of these are sort of um, measures of wealth which explain holiday expenditure. Let's call these A and B. Now, in general, I think it's possibly uh, right to say that as A is larger, the household income, B will be larger, the tax paid. Uh, that's what we would hope. It's not always the case. The reason for that is that is of course, that B is actually some function of A. So this function, the how you calculate tax given your income, this is not normally a linear function. So therefore these two variables A and B will not be perfectly correlated but they may be highly correlated. So that's a case where we're having highly correlated but not perfectly correlated variables. In example 2 we're looking at an um, example of perfect multicollinearity. So it's much less often that we see that. Let's say our dependent variable is the sales volume of individuals in a company and we request that on the months of the company, the months of training of the job and the months on the job. The way this is set up is such that the variables 1, how long you are with the company, is really split into variable 2 and 3. Okay, so 1 is equal to the sum of 2 or 3. You're with a company and if you're with the company you're either training or you're on the job. So what we have here is an example of perfect multicollinearity. So what that leads to is that actually beta, as we argued before, cannot be calculated. So that's a, that's a real serious problem. This is a breach of assumption up here. We just had highly correlated variables, so beta can still be calculated. We just have the problem of inflated standard errors. Now, why is that? Why do we get inflated standard errors? We refer back to this formula, uh, which you know from semester one. This is how we calculate the variance for the j element of beta hat. So, just as a reminder, uh, everything should be familiar, but the r squared j, that is the r squared of a regression of the j variable on all other explanatory variables. So, there could be three reasons why we have very high standard errors or high variances and therefore high standard errors.
let's start with reason 1. So there are three terms on the right hand side of this. So firstly let's look at the numerator term. If you have large sigma squares the model just doesn't fit the data well. Right? Large variance of error terms. Second, we may have very small SSTJ. What's that? The sum of square total of J. And that means that we have very little variation in the chafed variable. Or third, we may have the situation that we have very large R squared J and therefore large means very close to 1 and that me makes this parenthesis term in 153 close to 0 and therefore uh, causes a large variance. So this is the case where the variation in the J variable can be explained or a large degree of that variation can be explained by the other variables. That's what we earlier called just the case of imperfect multicollinearity. But that is the multicollinearity. That third reason is multicollinearity reason uh, leading to large variances of beta j hat. The other two key cases, one and two, are not really issues with multicollinearity. The question is then, what sort of action can we take if we have any of these situations? So, we'll just have a little column on the right here where we have the appropriate actions. Firstly, if you have large variances of the uh, error terms, well, you have to do everything to stop this, and that is include all relevant variables. That is a piece of advice which, anyway, you should have internalized already. Uh, and here's just another reason. You should include all relevant explanatory variables and that will minimize as far as possible the residual variance. What about the second reason here? If you have small variation in the chafed variable, well, you could try and increase your sample and in particular make an effort to find observations that are different in terms of the chafed variable, so observations that increase the variation in the chafed variable. So that would be the advice if that second aspect leads to large variances. Okay. If you want to know the impact of the chafed variable, you need variation in the chafed variable. That's basically the story here. So now we've discussed what to do if we have large variances for reasons one and two, what about for the, the third reason, the multicollinearity reason? You have variables that are highly, are very strongly related to each other. In this case, there's basically two pieces of advice one could give. The first one, let's consider the case where you have a number of variables that basically capture the same thing. This is what we had in example one, the income and the tax, but tax was really a function of income. In that case, you should really consider excluding one of these variables. In that case, more variables certainly isn't better. Okay, so the additional variable mainly serves to inflate the variance here. So include one of exclude one of these variables. The second case where you're having a large number of explanatory variables and it just so happens so that could be hundreds. Sometimes we have examples where we have hundreds of explanatory variables and it just so happens that there's some combination of variables, explanatory variables that explain another ex explanatory variables variable very very well. So that may lead to the multicollinearity issue perhaps not perfect, but very strong correlation between variables. In that case, you may consider something which uh, is sometimes called, oh no, which is called principal components analysis. So you may want to reduce the number of explanatory variables. You can do that in sort of clever ways. Uh, you're basically trying to extract the most information out of them. But we don't deal with that here, so you don't need to know anything about principal components.